Allow me to share some background about my wife and me. I'm Shane, aged 45, and my wife is Carrie, aged 44. We've been married for 23 years and have a daughter named Casey, who is currently in her final semester of college. Casey has always brought immense joy into our lives and is pursuing a degree in education with the goal of becoming a math teacher. I grew up on a ranch in a small Texas town, where I worked diligently while still finding time for sports, rodeos, and socializing. Following high school, I pursued a college education in agriculture with aspirations of becoming a high school agricultural teacher. Given my parents' limited finances, I worked part-time to help support our family. During my last semester of college, my parents decided to retire and sold the ranch, opting for a modest home in town. Tragically, they were both eliminated in a car accident on their way back from my graduation. Being their only child, I inherited the proceeds from the sale, which amounted to around $400,000, a surprising revelation since they had never disclosed the exact amount to me. The following months were exceptionally challenging as I mourned the loss of my parents, particularly given the suddenness of their passing. However, I persevered through my grief and in August, seized an opportunity to teach agricultural science at a high school just outside Austin. I also decided to utilize my inheritance to purchase a quaint 25-acre ranch on the outskirts of town. Here, I constructed a modern log cabin, a horse barn, and a training ring for the horses I planned to acquire, along with investing in some cattle. While I wasn't actively seeking a spouse, I was open to the idea of finding someone to share my life and dreams of starting a family. Approximately a month into the school year, I met Carrie through a setup arranged by my mentor teacher. Initially, I was hesitant, but I figured it was worth a shot, given my circumstances. When Carrie answered the door, I was immediately struck by her incredible beauty. Our first date, which included dinner and drinks, went smoothly, and I felt a strong connection with Carrie. As we conversed on her balcony later that evening, I couldn't help but wonder why such an exceptional woman was still single. Carrie echoed my sentiments, complimenting my attributes and expressing her attraction. Blushing, I admitted that I had never felt this way about anyone before and that there was something truly special about her. Well, Shane, thank you. I can relate. Most of the men I've dated were either clueless or inappropriate. I've never encountered someone I wanted to seriously commit to until tonight. I turned to her, and as our eyes met, we shared a kiss. It wasn't an overly aggressive, messy French kiss, but a gentle, tender one. We lingered in that embrace for several minutes. Then I spoke up. Look, Carrie, I'd like to see you again. We don't have to rush into anything, but I'm interested in seeing where this goes. I want to truly understand you before we... Well, you know, Shane, you're one of the sweetest men I've ever met. You were a true gentleman. Most guys would already be trying to make moves, she interjected. I chuckled and replied, I'd be lying if I said that thought hadn't crossed my mind. You're incredibly beautiful and alluring. However, I hold you in high regard. Despite our recent meeting, I'm looking to build a meaningful relationship, not just a fleeting encounter. She leaned in for another kiss before saying, Me too. Shane, you're one of a kind, and I'm eager to get to know you better. Carrie came from a modest background where college wasn't financially feasible. Opting for vocational training and administrative secretarial skills, she had been employed by a successful small business in Austin for the past few years. Over the next several months, we grew close and fell in love. About four weeks after our first date, we shared our first cozy moment. It was passionate and intense, happening in the front seat of my truck after a movie. We barely made it to the truck before our desires took over. The windows fogged up and the truck rocked as we experienced simultaneous euphoria. Carrie's fervor was undeniable, filling the cab with her cries of pleasure. We retreated to my home, spending the night entwined in each other's arms. It was a night of profound connection and passion, solidifying our love. In March, she moved in with me, and by June 1st, we were married. A little over a year later, Casey arrived, and for the next 23 years, we enjoyed a blissful family life. Though not affluent, we were content. Our bed life remained vibrant, with Carrie's passion never wavering, and neither did mine. Admittedly, over the past five or six months, our closeness had slowed, but the spark still seemed present, or did it? Here's the situation 23 years later. About half a year back, 
Carey landed a fresh job as the executive secretary for the CEO and proprietor of BRB Enterprises. Her employer, Benjamin Brockman, owned a manufacturing firm specializing in high-end electronics for the U.S. government. Given his considerable wealth, I assumed his company was thriving, especially since he was its sole owner. Carey seemed quite fond of her new position and often spoke highly of her boss, Ben. Initially, I felt a twinge of jealousy until I met him. At 58 years old, he was balding and overweight, making me feel like a model compared to him. When I queried Carrie about it, she laughed, reassuring me that no one could hold a candle to me, babe. She frequently expressed her appreciation for our cozy moments, which eased my concerns. However, my unease resurfaced when Carrie began accompanying him on business trips lasting two or three days. Despite my inquiries, she dismissed them as routine work duties, insisting that she had her own accommodations and that they were entirely focused on business matters. Although still somewhat apprehensive, Carrie gave me no cause for doubt, so I refrained from further discussion. That brings me to that pivotal Friday. After returning home from school, I headed straight for the barn, where I'd been for about an hour when Carrie arrived. As she got out of her car and started walking toward the house, I called out, expressing my eagerness to see her and offering to prepare steaks for supper. Carrie, having been away on another three-day business trip with her boss, glanced my way, but only nodded before entering the house. Inside, I grabbed a beer from the fridge and asked if she would prefer a beer or a glass of wine. She replied that a glass of wine would be lovely, still avoiding eye contact and staring at the floor. Sensing her unease, I brought her a glass of wine and placed the bottle beside her. Finally looking up at me, Carrie appeared troubled. After exchanging a kiss and hug, I inquired about what was wrong, noting her seeming distress. Carrie drained her wine glass in one gulp before pouring more, her actions betraying her inner turmoil. I reassured her, urging her to share what was on her mind, assuring her it couldn't be that bad. She responded, indicating the gravity of the situation and asking me to listen without interruption before continuing. With bated breath, I awaited her revelation, unprepared for what would come next. Shane, I need you to understand that I love you wholeheartedly. What I'm about to say isn't a reflection of you being inadequate as a husband, partner, friend, or father. You're the most incredible man I've ever known. As she spoke, I sensed this conversation was heading toward a life-altering revelation. Shane, I've made the decision to file for divorce. I'll be leaving immediately. Your concerns about Ben and me are valid. We've been having an affair for the past five months. He's fallen deeply in love with me, and we plan to marry once our divorce is finalized. We'll divide everything equally, but you'll keep the house, ranch, and all possessions. I'll only take my clothes and personal items. Pausing briefly, she allowed her words to sink in. Go ahead, I replied, surprisingly composed despite the seething anger and profound hurt inside me. I'll file for a divorce, citing irreconcilable differences. Let's make this process as swift, straightforward, and painless as possible, she continued, giving me an opportunity to respond. And respond I did. Carrie, do you love Ben? I respect him and find him intriguing. Perhaps I'll come to love him in time. Carrie, does Ben fulfill you physically more than I do? Is he a better lover? Were you dissatisfied with our closeness? No, Shane, he doesn't even come close. You've always been a fantastic lover, and I've always been satisfied by you, she reassured. Have I mistreated you? Are you unhappy with me? I'm struggling to comprehend why you're ending our marriage and breaking up our family. Carrie, I'm genuinely confused, I admitted. Shane, when I'm kind to Ben, he lavishes me with extravagant gifts. He loves me deeply and enjoys demonstrating his appreciation. He believes marrying him would provide a life of ease, free from work and abundant in luxury, fancy cars, global travel, designer clothes, and fine dining, she explained. So this is about money? You're trading up for a wealthy man? Well, Carrie, there's a word for what you're doing. And it starts with app, I retorted bitterly. Carrie protested tearfully, insisting that she was not a call girl's she expressed regret for causing me pain, but explained her decision to pursue the opportunity to marry a wealthy man. I responded, conveying the immense pain her actions were causing me. I expressed my disappointment, recounting the 23 years of hard work and dedication I had given to provide for her, 
offering everything from love and affection to my heart and soul. Apologizing for not meeting her expectations with my income, I requested some time alone and informed her that I would be in the barn while she packed, sensing Carrie's remorse. But her focus seemed fixed on her newfound wealth. As I sat on a bale of hay in the barn, I felt an overwhelming surge of emotion. This was different. This time tears streamed down my face. I rarely cried. My father had taught me that men don't. Yet, in that moment, I felt like utter despair. What could I have done differently? Was this my fault? These thoughts pierced my heart as I wept, realizing this would be the last time Carrie would bring me to tears. Carrie entered the barn, glanced at me, and exclaimed, Oh my God, what have I done? Shane, you never cry. Have I hurt you that much? Oh Shane, I am so sorry. Well, Carrie, out of nowhere you come home and drop the bombshell. You're wrecking our marriage, tearing our family apart, moving out, and filing for divorce and for the past five months, you've been with another man. To top it off, you claim it's because I didn't earn enough money, yet you say you still love me. But it seems love means nothing to you anymore. Shane, I've got to go. Ben and I are flying to Paris early tomorrow. We'll be gone a few days. When I return, I'll start the divorce proceedings as soon as possible. You seem in a hurry to throw away our 23 years together. Have you considered Casey's reaction? I'll call her tonight. She'll understand. Ben has promised to buy her a new Mercedes and pay off her college loans, including the ones you took out. No thanks, Carrie. I can handle my own loans, and I doubt Casey can be bought like you have been. She gave me a strange look but remained silent. You better go, Carrie. But know that once you leave, it's final. I won't take you back. This spells disaster. So don't come crying to me. Oh, and make sure to please your sugar daddy tonight. I sensed she pondered my words for a moment. I thought she might reconsider. But then she bid, Goodbye, Shane. I love you and will miss you. With a soft reply, I said, I love you too, Carrie. After sitting down and shedding more tears, I eventually gathered myself and made a decision to move forward. Addressing my two horses, I acknowledged that they were now the only females left in my life and expressed my confidence in their loyalty. I walked over, petted them both, and they responded with nods and nudges. Heading back to my empty house, I grabbed another beer. About an hour later, Casey called. Dad, are you okay? I just talked to mom. Has she lost it? What's she thinking? She's hooked up with a sugar daddy and believes his wealth will bring her happiness. I replied, I guess I couldn't fulfill all her desires in life. That's garbage, Dad. She believes that old creep and his money will complete her life. She tried to convince me he'll be a great stepdad, promising me a new car and paying off my college loans. I told her to stick that car where the sun don't shine. I had to chuckle. Thank goodness my daughter saw through it. I assured her and we chatted, lifting my spirits. She pledged her support and vowed to steer clear of the sugar daddy. After a few beers, I drifted off to sleep on the couch, but my night was troubled by several unsettling dreams, one of which took place in a mall. In the dream, I stumbled upon Carrie performing mouth lovemaking on Ben in a women's dressing room. She glanced up, laughed, and continued, despite Ben's notably short member, measuring merely two inches. The next morning, my old college roommate Jerry called and greeted me, mentioning that we had stayed in touch over the years. He reminded me that he works for the FBI's fraud division and had served as my best man at our wedding, remaining one of my closest friends. It had been a couple of months since our last conversation. I responded to Jerry's greeting, asking how he had been, he replied that he had been pretty good and inquired about my well-being. I admitted that things weren't going so great, explaining that Carrie had left me the day before and was seeking a divorce, which was why I was reaching out. Jerry expressed urgency in needing to see me as he was in town, offering to come quickly if it was okay with me. I questioned Jerry about how he could have known about Carrie leaving me, to which he replied that he didn't actually know. However, he had some information to share that he believed would interest me. Agreeing to meet shortly, I pondered what Jerry could possibly know about my situation. It all seemed increasingly bizarre. Though thoughts of revenge hadn't crossed my mind, I had a sinking feeling they were imminent. Jerry arrived about 30 minutes later, and I offered him a cup of coffee as we settled on my back deck on that lovely morning. Jerry remarked on the peaceful and beautiful surroundings before expressing his regret about the end of my marriage. Though I shared everything with him, 
he didn't seem surprised. Jerry, it seems like you already knew about Carrie and Ben, I remarked. Shane, what I'm about to tell you stays between us, Jerry cautioned. I shouldn't be telling you this, but as your friend, I feel obligated. We never had this conversation and you can't share it with anyone. Of course, Jerry, this sounds more serious than just a marital issue, I replied. It is, Shane. It's also official business on my part. I'm involved in an operation concerning Benjamin Brockman. We suspect he's been committing fraud with government contracts, potentially defrauding the U.S. government of millions. If proven, he's in serious trouble. We've been undercover, gathering evidence for several months. Another couple of months, and I think we'll have all the evidence we need to bring him to justice. Wow, Jerry, this is fantastic. I despise that idiot. I'd do anything to see him brought down. It would serve Carrie right. And how could she be so foolish? Leaving you for that idiot was a dumb move on her part. Plus, since Carrie is his executive secretary, she's become a person of interest in this investigation. Holy crap. Jerry, is Carrie implicated in this fraud? We don't believe so. We haven't found any evidence indicating she's aware of his crimes. However, she'll become entangled eventually. When everything unravels, she'll be in for a rude awakening. She believes she's gaining a wealthy new husband and will live happily ever after. During our surveillance, we uncovered Carrie's affair with Ben. I was waiting until I had solid proof. Then I planned to inform you, Shane. I suppose her lust for wealth led her to betray you. Jerry opened his briefcase and produced a large envelope. Tossing it to me, he said, Here's plenty of evidence of their affair if you want to use it in your divorce. If anyone asks, you didn't get this from me. I opened the envelope. Inside were eight X10 photos, emails, and several explicit videos clearly showing them having lovemaking, accompanied by dates and times. It was difficult to look at and stirred up my emotions once again. I maintained my composure and thanked Jerry for his efforts. Interestingly, in the close-ups of her face during lovemaking, Carrie didn't seem to be enjoying it at all. There was a lot of faking on her part. I know how she acts when pleased, and I never saw her behave like that during our lovemaking. Another ironic detail. Ben did indeed have a small male organ. Jerry mentioned he had to return to work. He informed me that he would be in town for a few more days, but anticipated D-Day with Brockman to be imminent. Jerry, how about we grab dinner tomorrow night? It's on me for all you've done for me in this mess. Sounds great, Shane. My sister Ashley is coming tomorrow. Would it be all right if she joined us? Absolutely. I haven't seen her since she was 13 in braces. She's 36 now and quite stunning, I hear. Ironically, her divorce was finalized today. Seems she returned home early from a business trip and caught her husband in bed with his secretary. We might have something to discuss then. She's a partner at a corporate law firm, and she's here to open a new office for them. Perhaps she could assist you in finding a good divorce attorney. I'll definitely ask her about that. See you tomorrow. I met Jerry and Ashley at a local Mexican restaurant the following evening. Jerry's sister was indeed stunning, as he had described. She greeted me warmly with a hug and a kiss on the cheek. I teased her about her transformation from the little 13-year-old with braces and pigtails, to which she giggled and responded that she had grown up and become a woman. Reflecting on the past, I acknowledged teasing her about her braces and admitted that she had turned out to be one of the most beautiful women I had ever met. During dinner, Ashley and I discussed my situation as Jerry had briefed her on the details. We agreed to keep it confidential due to the ongoing investigation. Jerry mentioned I could release the photos and videos, claiming they were obtained by a private investigator. I informed them of Carrie's plan to file for divorce upon her return from Paris, citing irreconcilable differences. Crap, Ashley interjected. You need to take the offensive. I know an excellent family lawyer who specializes in infidelity divorces. She took my ex-husband to the cleaners. I have her card in my hotel room. We can grab it later and get started on Monday so you can serve Carrie when she returns from Paris. Things were moving quickly, but I was impressed with Ashley's assertiveness and wondered if she'd be interested in going out with me. Towards the end of dinner, Jerry received a call and had to leave. He offered to cover the bill, but I insisted it was my treat. Ashley and I finished our margaritas and prepared to leave. She suggested going dancing since the night was still young. I agreed that there was a place nearby. We spent the next two hours dancing, drinking beer, and thoroughly enjoying each other's company. To say we hit it off would be an understatement. 
we seemed incredibly compatible. I felt relaxed and content in her arms. Afterward, we returned to the restaurant to retrieve her car. She asked me to follow her to her hotel so she could give me the lawyer's card. Once in her room, she handed me the card and instructed me to call her friend's cell phone the next day, suggesting a meeting on Monday. She assured me that she would also inform her friend in advance, expressing confidence that her friend would be accommodating since they were close. Expressing gratitude, I asked how I could ever repay her. She responded by throwing her arms around me and kissing me passionately. We both engaged in the kiss and then moved to the bed, where we continued to passionately make out for a few minutes until we both needed to come up for air. During the pause, I expressed my desire to kiss her since I first saw her, to which she reciprocated, complimenting me on my looks and handsomeness. We continued kissing passionately, and our hands began to explore each other. She touched me through my jeans, and I felt incredibly aroused. As my hand slipped under her blouse, I suggested that we should take it slow, expressing concern about taking advantage of her in her vulnerable state after her recent divorce. She responded, asserting her independence as a grown woman and stating that she knew what she wanted. She admitted being deeply attracted to me and hoped that I felt the same, implying that she might be the one taking advantage of me. She recounted her initial reaction to discovering her husband's affair, admitting that she initially blamed herself and questioned if she was lacking in some way. However, she eventually came to the realization that it wasn't her fault, recognizing her own attributes of youth, attractiveness, and confidence. She expressed hope that I didn't blame myself for Carrie leaving, as she initially did in her own situation. She shared her thoughts from the previous night, where she had wondered if she had caused everything, questioning if she was a bad husband who couldn't fulfill all of his wife's needs. However, after spending time with me that night, she concluded that it wasn't her fault. He mentioned that he had been a good father, husband, and lover, providing everything he could. They kissed some more, but mostly just cuddled on the bed, finding comfort in each other's presence. The next morning, they woke up in each other's arms. He invited her to lunch at his house and suggested they go horseback riding, which she enjoyed. Later they ended up on the couch, where things heated up again, but it remained only a heavy makeout session. He mentioned that they decided to continue seeing each other and see where it leads. He took Monday off and met with Julia, the attorney recommended by Ashley. He recounted his story and presented all the evidence he had. Julia appeared disgusted with his wife's behavior and attitude, which didn't surprise him given her 30 years of experience as a lawyer. She proposed filing for divorce based on infidelity and abandonment, seeking ownership of the house, ranch, and assets. They had $10,000 in savings, which they would split. I would retain all the money in our checking account. Ashley was already paying her car payment, and her credit card was in her name, so she would keep them in her name. I covered her car and health insurance. Julia advised me to cancel both as soon as possible. Any credit cards in both our names would be canceled. Julia pretty much covered all my bases. She said we would only use the explicit photos and videos if necessary. Julia wanted to know when Carrie would be back from Paris. I told her it was supposed to be Thursday morning. I provided Julia with the address Carrie had left me in case of any mail forwarding. Julia said she would serve her Thursday morning. She may not like the infidelity part, but I think she will agree to everything else. She seemed satisfied with her new financial situation and eager for a quick divorce. So she can marry Mr. Brockman. Julia proposed informing Carrie that she would modify the infidelity section of the divorce papers if she signed them as they were. I responded affirmatively, expressing the desire for Carrie to acknowledge her infidelity. Around 10.30 a.m. on Thursday morning, my cell phone rang, and since I didn't have a class, I answered it. It was Carrie, sounding upset, questioning why she had received divorce papers, as we had agreed that I would file for divorce. I explained to Carrie that I hadn't agreed to anything and that I was simply trying to expedite meeting her wishes. She questioned the content of the divorce papers, particularly the mention of infidelity and abandonment, which I suggested changing to irreconcilable differences. Carrie reiterated that she hadn't agreed to anything and proposed that I accept the settlement, indicating that I would soon be a wealthy man's wife. She offered to modify the infidelity and abandonment grounds to irreconcilable differences if I signed the settlement as it was. 
I informed Julia that Carey wanted the revised copy, which she would have Ben's lawyer review. If he approved, Carey would sign. After briefing Julia on my conversation with Carey, Julia had the updated papers ready to send over, as she had anticipated. Julia mentioned that she knew Ben's lawyer, describing him as a corporate attorney with no experience in divorce, predicting that he would likely advise Carrie to sign without much consideration. True to Julia's prediction, Carrie signed the papers, and they were returned to Julia's office by Friday afternoon. I stopped by and signed them on my way home from work. The divorce would be finalized in 60 days. I called Ashley, and we arranged to meet for dinner near her new office. We had a pleasant dinner and talked for about two hours. Ashley sensed that I needed to discuss everything, and indeed I did. We decided to refrain from any cozy activities that night and save them for Saturday night instead. Later that night, Carrie called and expressed concern about my well-being. She informed me that she no longer had the right to use terms of endearment with me. I was firm in stating that I would survive despite the pain she had caused me, emphasizing that she had hurt me deeply. However, I also conveyed that it didn't matter anymore as she had achieved what she wanted, and unfortunately, I was no longer what she desired. Carrie expressed remorse, saying she didn't mean to hurt me and that she still loved me very much. I responded dismissively, informing her that in the settlement, I would be cancelling her car and health insurance waiting until next Friday for her to arrange coverage. She thanked me and assured me that Ben would take care of everything. I clarified that I wasn't worried, I was just letting her know. As our conversation neared its end, Carrie bid goodbye, expressing hope that I wouldn't think she's a terrible person for her actions. She stated that she had to do what she had to do and reiterated her love for me. At this point, I began to feel emotional. I was sure Carrie could sense my final words, expressing my farewell and wishing her a nice life with her new man. I ended the call before she could say anything else. It was time to embark on my own new life, and I had intentions for Ashley to play a significant role in it. Ashley arrived at my house on Saturday night at 6 o'clock. She looked stunning and alluring. Let me paint you a picture. She stands at about 5 feet 9 inches, with long blonde hair, shapely legs, and the most perfect curves I've ever seen. She looked like a goddess incarnate. Her full, shapely lips begged to be kissed. She wore a cute little red dress that accentuated her figure, revealing some cleavage. My excitement was already evident, straining against my jeans. We enjoyed a lovely dinner on my deck overlooking the ranch, accompanied by plenty of wine. We dined, drank, flirted, and conversed for about two hours. Finally, she looked at me and conveyed that if I didn't take her to bed soon, she would explode referring to me as cowboy. I literally swept her off her feet and carried her to my bedroom. We wasted no time undressing and indulging in each other's company. Over the next few weeks, Ashley and I spent a considerable amount of time together. I proposed that she move in, but she preferred to wait until after my divorce was finalized. Nonetheless, she often spent nights in my bed. About five days before my divorce was official, Jerry called me. He informed me that they were on the verge of taking action against Brockman and his business. Everything Brockman owned would be seized, as they had amassed substantial evidence and witnesses against him. What about Carrie? I inquired. She'll be questioned, but it seems she's in the clear. However, she'll be losing her financial support. She's in for a rough ride, Shane. That's her problem, I guess. Shane, I want you to know that my sister is thrilled with your relationship. She was devastated after her divorce. Is there a chance you might become my brother-in-law someday? I hope so, Jerry. It depends on whether she wants me to. I can tell you, though, that I've fallen in love with your sister. She loves you too, Shane. I'll keep you posted on the Brockman situation. I wouldn't be surprised if Carrie reaches out to you. It was Friday, and I was eagerly anticipating spending the weekend with Ashley. It also marked the day my marriage to Carrie officially ended. On my way home from work, I stopped at a convenience store for some beer for the weekend. What happened next could be called fate, luck, or justice, but it was certainly peculiar. Carrie called me. She wanted to meet. I agreed to lunch. I invited Ashley, but she declined, knowing the purpose of the meeting and trusting me to handle it. I had taken the entire week off from work, planning to resign once they found a replacement. Additionally, we were busy moving Ashley into my place. Carrie and I met at a nice downtown restaurant, per my suggestion. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw her. 
She had gained weight and frankly didn't look good. The past few days must have been overwhelming for her. It had been widely covered in the news, with her name mentioned frequently. There were even reports suggesting she was Brockman's mistress. I noticed people staring and pointing as she entered. Opting for an open area outside, we found a table away from prying eyes to have our conversation. Initially, we engaged in small talk, but it wasn't long before she broke down in tears. Shane, leaving you was the biggest mistake of my life, she confessed. I'm not saying this just because Ben got arrested. I realized it a few weeks after moving in with him. Initially, it seemed exciting, but the allure of money faded quickly. I was miserable, and I felt sick every time I had to be cozy with him. I didn't expect this, Carrie continued. I thought money was all that mattered when I left you. I've also been overwhelmed with guilt for what I've done to you and Casey. Casey barely speaks to me anymore. You didn't deserve that, Shane. You were a good husband and provider. I had everything I needed. I just didn't see it. Thank you, Carrie. I appreciate your honesty, I replied. But you made the choices you did because you weren't completely happy with me. I was happy with you, Shane, she insisted. I let that old goat manipulate me. He seduced me, convinced me to leave you for him and his money. The night before his arrest, he forced himself on me. He's a disgusting, perverted old man. I hope he rots in jail. Despite wanting to laugh, I refrained. Where is this leading, Carrie? What do you want from me? I asked. Tears welled up in her eyes as she pleaded, Please take me back, Shane. I love you and miss you terribly. I miss our home, the ranch, the horses, and everything we shared. I'll do anything to make it right. Carrie, do you truly miss me? Or is this because you have no money, home, or job? I inquired. I'm broke, Shane, with nowhere to go, she confessed. But I miss you terribly. I want things to go back to how they were. Carrie, when you left, I made it clear it was final. There's no turning back, I reiterated. Your departure was permanent. I understand, Shane, but I need you desperately. I'm at my wit's end. You're my last hope. I'm sorry, Carrie. I've moved on and found love with someone else. We'll marry eventually, but we're not rushing things due to our past experiences with our spouses, I explained. Carrie looked devastated, tears streaming down her face. It seemed she hadn't considered the possibility of me moving on. She sat there sobbing, and I couldn't help but feel sorry for her. I once contemplated revenge when you left, but now I want to help, I said. Is there anything I can do to assist you? Carrie looked up and requested, I suppose I was naive to hope you'd take me back. I don't blame you. I wouldn't take me back either. If you could lend me $5,000 until I find a job and a place of my own. I'm staying with a friend, but I need my own place. How much do you need, Carrie? I asked. If you could loan me $5,000, I'll start paying you back once I find employment, she replied. As the waiter brought our food, Carrie began eating, but my appetite had waned. Observing her, I pulled out my checkbook and wrote a check. Handing it to her folded, I said, Carrie, this should help you start anew. You're a skilled secretary. You'll find a job. If not, let me know, and I'll see what I can do. I regret how things unfolded. My dream was to grow old with you, holding hands as Casey said her wedding vows, watching our grandkids take their first horseback ride, and being buried beside you on a ranch. It seems fate had other plans. With that, I rose from the table and left the restaurant. Placing a $100 bill to cover the bill and tip, I stole a glance back as she opened the check. Her expression shifted to disbelief as she looked up, finding me already gone. I had left her a check with a pointed message. Smirking, I departed. She observed from the deck as I drove away. Afterward, Ashley moved in, and we tied the knot the following spring. Jerry served as my best man, and Casey assumed the role of maid of honor, having become close friends. The wedding occurred in Vegas at Caesar's Palace, with a select group of friends and family in attendance. The reception was held in our honeymoon suite, creating a memorable affair for everyone. I struck it lucky, winning over $200,000 on a progressive slot machine, showcasing my knack for accumulating money through gambling. Carrie wasn't part of the festivities, but she got wind of the news through the local paper. Eventually, she found a job and a place to live, though she never reimbursed the loan, which I didn't anticipate. Rumor has it she's now dating a high school English teacher, and I hope it brings her happiness. Meanwhile, Ben Brockman faced trial and was convicted of federal crimes. All his assets were seized to repay the government, 
and he'll be spending a considerable time behind bars. Perhaps he'll find companionship more suited to his taste there. 